بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد uh, so since we are resuming after a almost three month uh, two and a half month gap and also um, there are some new faces and also some of you asked for uh, this uh, we have to do a quick refresher before we move on so inshallah half of today will be refresher and then the other half we will inshallah ta'ala move on and I hope to finish inshallah ta'ala uh, Abu Bakr al-Siddiq Khilafa inshallah by next Wednesday inshallah we hope to finish that maybe we'll delay it for one more week depending on how many details I go into but uh, we will be done with the Khilafa Abu Bakr inshallah very soon so we begin with a quick refresher we were talking about Abu Bakr al-Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala an and we began with a brief history of the life and times and Khilafa of Abu Bakr al-Siddiq now uh, we went over a number of controversies and I want everybody to just be aware of these controversies uh, of the simplest controversies of the first controversies we talked about is the Khilafa of Abu Bakr al-Siddiq was it something that the Prophet ﷺ commanded the Sahaba to do or was it something that he the Sahaba chose to do. We talked about this controversy. Who can remember what was the conclusion that was reached? Was this a command or was this something that happened amongst the Sahaba? Amongst the Sahaba without any precedent, without any basis? There were a lot of insinuations. This is what we had uh, agreed upon. There were a lot of insinuations, a lot of hints. But the Prophet ﷺ never explicitly commanded uh, the Sahaba to choose Abu Bakr al-Siddiq to be the, uh, the next uh, Khalifa. And of those evidences that are mentioned that Abu Bakr al-Siddiq was supposed to be the next Khalifa are what? Who can tell me? What are some of the evidences found in the Sunnah? These are very important theological concepts by the way. Because this, this is what differentiates us from the other. He, the number one evidence, the number one evidence is that when the Prophet realized he was about to pass away, he insisted that Abu Bakr al-Siddiq lead the Salah. And that is not a trivial matter at all. It indicates that the successorship will be uh, after him to Abu Bakr al-Siddiq. What else was there? <coughs> what else was there? <coughs> other evidences. Closing the doors except for the doors of Abu Bakr. Okay. All of the doors leading to the masjid other than the door of Abu Bakr. Valid point. What else was there? So of the blessings Abu Bakr has, this is more of a blessings. That Abu Bakr Siddiq was the one who migrated with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And other, there are other uh, evidences as well. For example, premonitions and dreams. For example, uh, Umar ibn Khattab saw a dream. Oh, sorry, the Prophet saw a dream with, with, and he saw in it Abu Bakr and Umar. And he said, I saw myself pulling from the well. Then Abu Bakr came after me and he pulled and there was some weakness. Then Umar came after me and he pulled and it was a massive flood or bucket. So these are evidences that indicate that Abu Bakr al-Siddiq would take over after the Prophet wasallam. However, there doesn't seem to be an explicit command. Why, is, why do we say there was no explicit command? Why do we say this? We concluded this. This is the conclusion. Some ulama, by the way, said there was a command. Why do we say there wasn't a command? This is, this is a wisdom, but what is the evidence that we have that there was no explicit command from the Prophet Because some of the Ansar were deciding Exactly, because some of the Sahaba were debating amongst themselves who would be the Khalifa. And the Ansar wanted Sa'ad ibn Ubadah. And even amongst the Muhajirun, Abu Bakr himself said, choose Umar ibn Khattab or or Abu Ubaidah and you are saying Abu Rahman ibn Auf no, no, that's going to come later on. Okay, the, the point being that both the Ansar and the Muhajirun had a discussion. Now, is it possible that they're having a discussion and there's an explicit hadith and nobody brings it up? Oh, I heard the Prophet ﷺ say, Abu Bakr should be the Khalifa after me. No. So therefore, clearly Abu Bakr as-Siddiq was hinted at, but 
There was no explicit command from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and this is the standard position of mainstream uh, Sunni Islam. Now we also went over the briefly the biography of Bakr al-Siddiq. What is his name? Everybody should have memorized his name. Abdullah ibn Abu Quhafa is his name. So Abi Quhafa is his name. Is his father's name Abu Quhafa? It's his kunya. What is his father's name? Abdullah ibn Uthman. Abu, ibn, uh, Abu Quhafa, his name is Uthman. Okay. So Abu Bakr's name is Abdullah. And his father's name is Uthman. And he is more commonly known Abu Bakr ibn Abi Quhafa. Okay, this is his common titles name. But his actual name, birth name, is Abdullah ibn Uthman. And uh, Abu Bakr al-Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala an was of course from the tribe of the uh, Quraysh. And he was from the sub-tribe of the Banu Taym. The sub-tribe of the Banu Taym. So he was a Taymi. So he was not a Hashimi. The, 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 the Quraysh had at least 10 sub-tribes. And the Taymi tribe was one of the smaller ones and it was not one of the more prestigious of the Quraysh. So the Hashim, uh, the Hashimites, the Banu Abdadar, the, uh, the Banu Makhzum, these were the big names. And the Taymis uh, and the Banu Adi, which is where Umar al-Khattab is from. So Umar is Banu Adi and Abu Bakr is Banu Taym and Uthman is Banu Umayyah, Banu Abdul Shams, Banu Umayyah is the same thing. He's the Umayyah, Umayyah. Banu Umayyah is fine. And of course, Ali is Hashimi, radiallahu anhu ajma'in. So you should know these things. We had, these are simple facts. You should all know them. That Abu Bakr as Siddiq is from the Taym, the Banu Taym. And Umar is the Banu Adi. And Uthman is, you can say Umawi, it's fine. Even though they don't typically say Banu Abdul Shams, but Umawi is fine. Okay, he's from the Umayyad. Uh, what was to become the Umayyad clan, we can say. That is the Uthman. Uh, and because Uthman and Muawiyah were first cousins. Uthman and Muawiyah were first cousins. And so Muawiyah is the founder of the Umayyad dynasty. And that's why, by the way, between the Umayyads and the Alids, they call them the Alids, uh, the, the Banu Hashemite political movement. There was some tension for the first 200 years of Islam. In any case, so Abu Bakr al-Siddiq uh, is born in the Banu Taym tribe. And uh, one of the things that he was known for in early Islam was his knowledge of genealogy. This is really what his speciality was. He knew the tribes and he knew their histories and that is why multiple times the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would take benefit from his knowledge. Is there something in the air by the way? There seems to be some, hmm? some smoke or something. I hope nothing is burning because I'm... The what? Oh, that talcum powder is in the air. Okay, yeah, some, I'm getting some type of allergic reaction. Labas, is the spray. Okay, because I'm getting some type of reaction to that. Um, no problem. So. Uh, Abu Bakr al-Siddiq was known for his knowledge of genealogy. He had memorized the uh, histories and who can quote me even one incident, there's multiple. Who can quote me one incident in the lifetime of Abu Bakr that demonstrates this knowledge? One thing, there's... We, did, we didn't mention this. You're bringing something else. This is, this is not genealogy anyway. But we didn't mention this story. But. What, what is an... Uh, I can't hear you, what? Not Medina, Jazakallah Khair Yusuf. Uh, not Medina, when the people came to Mecca, the Prophet Sallallahu would ask Abu Bakr, who are these people, every time they would come. So the, uh, the, in the times of Hajj, the Prophet ﷺ would be accompanied by Abu Bakr as-Siddiq and he would ask them, which is tribe is this? And Abu Bakr would recognize them and tell them this is so and so. And then he would give them the background, he would give him the background information. Guys, it's as if you've never heard this before, went into so many details, like I see. Don't you remember some coming back? Coming back. That's why I'm doing this, otherwise you have forgotten everything, right? Oh, note keeper, you do not even know how many times I have been told to give salams to you from across the world. When you go back to Memphis, give the note keeper salam. So, okay, I will give salam, inshallah. I've even forgotten how many people, inshallah. Because they all know he takes notes, but he doesn't answer questions. So, that's why, alhamdulillah. <laughs> so, um, Abu Bakr al-Siddiq was known for his knowledge of genealogy and lineage. And also he was known for his akhlaq. And he was the closest to the Prophet sallallahu both in akhlaq and in friendship, and that's why they were the closest. Abu Bakr al-Siddiq has two titles. One of them we all know, al-Siddiq. And the other one is? 
The other one is that that's his kunya. That's his not al atiq al atiq. And as for al atiq, this was his name in jahiliyyah as well. It was a title in jahiliyyah. And as for as siddiq, we know this was given to him because what incident? The Isra al Mi'raj. Most of you, alhamdulillah, know this. The Isra al Mi'raj that he immediately believed in the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and he was given the title of as siddiq And that is also why the Prophet himself called him as siddiq So the title as siddiq occurs in a hadith. The Prophet Muhammad sallallahu himself called Abu Bakr as siddiq or the one who uh, is faithful and believes. And Abu Bakr as siddiq how many? Children did he have and how many times was he married? This is the biographical information. We went over it many times. I don't expect you to remember uh, this, these details, but at least you should know some of them. Okay, very good. With how, from how many women? Four. The first of them was Qutayla who never embraced Islam and most likely she died be, even maybe even before the coming of Islam. And he divorced her in Jahiliya. So she never... Uh, well, we don't know whether she embraced Islam or not, but there's no mention of her, so we assume she died or she had no uh, knowledge of Islam. And from Qutayla, he had his eldest child, and that is Abdullah. Abdullah. And Abdullah, he plays a role in, in the hijrah of the Prophet. And uh, Abdullah, as well, is the one who brought uh, Aisha uh, to Medina in the hijrah. Okay, so he was the one, Abdullah was the one who took his young sister Aisha on the hijrah. Okay, because Abu Bakr had already gone with the process. Of who's going to bring Aisha? So her eldest brother, uh, Abdullah. And uh, Abdullah, uh, radiallahu ta'ala, he passed away right after the death of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And he does not have that much mention in the books of Sirah. Looks like he was a very sickly character. He had some sicknesses and whatnot. He doesn't play a very prominent role. And uh, he passed away after the de death of the Prophet ﷺ. Abdullah had a full sister. Everybody knows. Asma. Asma. Abdullah had a full sister, and that is Asma. And of course, Asma, uh, many stories are mentioned about her. And inshallah, someday in our series, we'll eventually get to Asma and have a whole episode on Asma. His second wife was Umm Ruman. And Umm Ruman was the mother of Aisha radiallahu anha and Aisha's full brother Abdul Rahman. Okay? So you have Abdullah and Asma from the first wife. Then you have, and by the way, I'm going over this because you really need to know this type of basic stuff. Who are his children? They, and each one of them plays a role in the seerah by and large. So Aisha had a full brother, Abdul Rahman. Okay? So Aisha and Abdul Rahman have one uh, mother and that is Umm Ruman. Uh, and Umm Ruman is the one who's mentioned in the story of the slander. Umm Ruman is the one who's mentioned that the process and visited. So she is a central role in Medina. And she has many incidents in the seerah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The third wife of Abu Bakr as-Siddiq was Asma bint Umais, the famous Sahabiyya who was married to uh, three of the Sahaba, one after the other. And that is Ja'far and then Abu Bakr and then Ali. And she had children from all three of them. So Asma bint Umais was the Sahabiyya that married multiple Sahaba. Each one of them died basically a shaheed. Uh, so her husband Ja'far died, except Abu Bakr, he died as Siddiq, and then Ali also died. So she married multiple times, and she gave birth in all of these marriages. So she has, so Abu Bakr and Ali, radiallahu anhum, they have children that are brothers. You understand? The same mother, right? They have children that are brothers. Can you imagine the, the group that says there's problems between Abu Bakr and, 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 and Ali radiallahu anhum, how do you explain this simple fact? There, there doesn't seem to be much issue there. In any case, so with Asma bint Umais, uh, with Asma bint Umais, uh, Abu Bakr had his uh, son Muhammad, his son Muhammad. And Muhammad ibn Abi Bakr uh, was only a baby when the Prophet passed away. So he's not considered a Sahabi. Because a Sahabi is the one who saw the Prophet ﷺ and has a memory of it. Even if he's not Baligh, by the way. Even if he's not Baligh. So, Anas ibn Malik most likely passed, uh, the Prophet ﷺ passed away when, he, when he's still a child. Meaning not Baligh, most likely. Still, everybody considers him a Sahabi because for five years from the age of six till eleven or something, he was in the khidmah of the Prophet ﷺ. Uh, Ibn Abbas as well, he had not reached Bulugh. Ibn Abbas was also a young child 
meaning 13 years old, 12 years old, yet he is considered of the greatest of the Sahaba. But Muhammad ibn Abi Bakr, he was one year old. So a one year old child does not get the status of Sahabi. So Muhammad ibn Abi Bakr was not uh, considered to be, is not considered to be amongst the uh, Sahaba. And because Abu Bakr passed away and he's barely, how old would he be when Abu Bakr passes away? Three. Three. Three years old. So who raised Muhammad ibn Abi Bakr? Ali ibn Abi Talib. Ali ibn Abi Talib raised Muhammad ibn Abi Bakr. Why? Because Asma married Ali. And so Muhammad ibn Abi Bakr goes to the house of Ali. And Ali radiallahu anhu loved Muhammad like a son. And uh, we didn't, we're not going to get into this, but um, Muhammad ibn Abi Bakr was a part of the group that uh, was problematic with Uthman. And Uthman ibn Affan looked at him and said, if your father were here, he would not be happy with you. Meaning he entered the room at the very last minute. He entered Uthman's room and he was with that group. And Uthman said to him, if your father were here, he would not be happy with you. And he felt so embarrassed and ashamed, he left the room. So he was not a part of the deed, but he was with the group that committed it. When they entered in upon the room, he was sympathetic to the adversaries of, uh, uh, of Uthman, but he didn't actually participate in that final uh, deed. Um, and then uh, the final uh, wife of Abu Bakr is Habiba bint Kharija, and she was the only one from the uh, Ansar, the other three from the Quraysh. So she was from the Ansar, and she gave birth uh, she gave birth to Umm Kulthum after the death of Abu Bakr. So Abu Bakr al-Siddiq passed away and uh, Habiba did not even know she was pregnant. And then she became pregnant and she gave birth to a daughter after Abu Bakr al-Siddiq and that is uh, Umm Kulthum. And uh, we had mentioned that Abu Bakr al-Siddiq uh, has one of the unique things in Islam that all of his family embraced Islam. His mother, his father, uh, his children, uh, all of the family. And this is almost unheard of amongst the Sahaba, that the parents and the children, all of them embrace Islam. His whole family was a family of Islam. It is there is hardly any other Sahabi, and I can't think of any, and other scholars say there, this didn't happen, that a person converted and his parents and all of his children in Mecca, this did, the, before the Hijrah, this did not um, happen. And of course, uh, he has also many other blessings as well. He has four generations of companions. So, uh, uh, Abdullah ibn Zubair, the son of Asma, the son of Abu Bakr, the son of Abu Qahafa. So, Abdullah ibn Zubair is the son of Asma, and Asma is the son of Abu Bakr, and Abu Bakr is the son of Abu Qahafa, and they're all Sahabi. So, you have four generations of Sahaba in one household. And that again is... Uh, pretty much unheard of. It is an exceptional uh, scenario. And of course, Abu Bakr's blessings go on and on. And I mentioned at least 10 or 15 of them, and we don't have time uh, to get into all of those uh, blessings. Uh, but the blessings of Abu Bakr al-Siddiq are second to none. And it is enough of a blessing that Allah mentions him in the Quran with a proper pronoun. And Allah calls him the companion. And no other Sahabi has been called Sahabi except Abu Bakr. إِذْ يَقُولُ لِصَاحِبِهِ لَا تَحْزَن So, exclusivity has been given to Abu Bakr at that level, that the Qur'an calls him Sahabi in Surah Tawbah. إِذْ يَقُولُ لِصَاحِبِهِ لَا تَحْزَن When he said to his companion, do not worry and do not be scared, and this is enough of a blessing for Abu Bakr as-Siddiq. And I mentioned at least a dozen incidents about Abu Bakr al-Siddiq and about his bravery and the fact that he participated in each and every ghazwa, uh, the fact that he uh, defended the Prophet almost until he died, like we talked about the incident, that he was beaten up, all of this, uh, the fact that there's hardly any narration except that we find Abu Bakr in it, the Prophet and Abu Bakr, the Prophet and Abu Bakr visited, the Prophet and Abu Bakr walked, the Prophet and Abu Bakr, always with him. There's hardly any incident in the seerah except that Abu Bakr al-Siddiq has a central role in it. And uh, this is why, of course, the Sahaba instantaneously understood that Abu Bakr al-Siddiq should be the one uh, in charge. Now, we mentioned some controversies. I'm not going to go into all of those details, but just as a refresher. And this is one of the reasons why I said I will not go into too much detail in the lives of the Sahaba. Because when you get to the lives of the Sahaba, you do not have the same... 
uh, sanctity and holiness that you have with the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The Sahaba were humans. And sometimes they might have done things that were not absolutely perfect, even though we respect all of them and don't impugn their character or their niyyas. But this doesn't mean that they were infallible. This doesn't mean that they were sinless. This doesn't mean they couldn't commit mistakes. So we speak good of them, but it gets difficult for the lay Muslim to hear some of these stories and then not have some bad doubts, and that's why it's best to simply avoid these things without going into too much detail. Nonetheless, certain things do need to be mentioned even if, if in passing, and especially in light of the fact that there are two main strands of Islam that differ over these issues to a great uh, deal. And I mentioned uh, two major controversies that you should be aware of, and I went into some detail, not as much as some of you would have liked, but some detail. The first of them was the issue of Ali radiallahu anhu, delaying or not giving the oath of allegiance for a period of time and I went into a lot of detail about uh, the, the, the story and one opinion says that he delayed for six months and another opinion says that he gave it in the beginning but then people began to doubt he gave it so he gave it again after six months there are two opinions out there whichever opinion you follow clearly in the end he gave his oath of allegiance and uh, I had mentioned that even if it is the first version, there's nothing wrong with that, but because there's nothing wrong with desiring uh, Khilafah for a good reason, and Ali ibn Abi Talib, it does seem that uh, he felt that he deserved it. And to be honest, he has some valid points, and that's why he eventually got it. And so he felt that he deserves uh, the Khilafah at this time, and Abu Bakr al-Siddiq visited him in his house, we talked about that incident, and he went without any protection, without anybody else. And even Umar al-Khattab said, Oh, Bakr al-Siddiq, don't go by yourself. Not that he was worried about physical harm, but you know, you get persuaded to say things, or you get pressured to do things. This was, Umar was worried about this. And Abu Bakr al-Siddiq said, I'm going to the house of the family of the Prophet And he had a very emotional one-on-one. -on -one. Well, it wasn't one-on-one, -on -one because the Banu Hashim were there. All of the Banu Hashim and Abu Bakr al-Siddiq. And this is recorded in the books of history. And he began crying, and he said, Verily, the family of the Prophet is more beloved to me than my own family. The family of the Prophet is more beloved to me than my own family. But, and then he went and he explained himself that this is not a matter of loving the family. It's, not a, matter, it's a matter of what is best for the Ummah. And basically, he was basically saying to Ali bin Abi Talib that you are not ready yet. This is not your time yet. And this is exactly what we believe as well. That he was indeed greatly qualified, but not when he's right now 30 years old. Give him some time. And when Ali ibn Abi Talib became of age, of maturity, if not that he wasn't mature at 30, but still, you cannot compare 60 with 30. Being a 30-year-old, even in any country, any land, how, you know, 30-year-old becomes the, the president, 30 is very unheard of. It's very, when you have people that are far more experienced in life. So Abu Bakr al-Siddiq basically said, it's not a matter of we don't love you, of course we love you. And so when this was said and whatnot, Ali ibn Abi Talib the next day then gave the bay'ah in public and there was a ceremony in public. Now, uh, this version of events, no doubt it's not something that many people hear about from our tradition, but it does seem to be the more correct one. And I said this and I hinted at it last time and I'll say it explicitly now. And it seems that this tension from the very beginning is what led to the two splits in Islam. This tension is not coming out of thin air. It existed from the very beginning of time. And it existed even amongst th themselves. But they themselves managed to overcome it and they cooperated together. And they didn't have any problem in their hearts. And for the rest of Abu Bakr's Khilafah and Umar's Khilafah and Uthman's Khilafah, Uthman radiallahu anhu is the most loyal servant, the most dedicated commander. He is the governor. Everything is there. So those feelings might have been there. But the true leader... The true nobility of Ali is demonstrated in that whatever what he thought was best for the ummah is best to cooperate. And so we see this over and over again. So this is the first uh, controversy I mentioned. And the second controversy uh, which is still used to this day is the controversy over the issue of Fadak, over the issue of the inheritance of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And one of the reasons why uh, this is so important even to, to this day amongst the other group is that it is symbolic of the legacy and heritage of the Prophet ﷺ. who gets it. It's not just the issue of money. It's the issue of, it's symbolic. So the Prophet ﷺ left behind Fadak. 
Sunni Islam says, who gets fadak? Who got it in the end? Guys? Who? The people. The people got it. So the legacy of the Prophet is inherited by all. We are all sharing that legacy. Right? But of course, for the other strand of Islam, who should have gotten it? The Al al Bayt. So, meaning what? The power, the politics, the claim for authority. Who should get it? In Sunni Islam, the whole Sunni Ummah, basically, the ulama, they're the ones who inherit the Prophet. ﷺ. But in the other version of Islam, one family, one person. So, Fadak is not just about money, it's about symbolizing the legacy. Who gets to inherit the legacy, interpret the legacy, to take power, to, to do tafsir, to, to derive fiqh? It's not just money anymore. So for us, it is all ulama, anybody. You, if you dedicated 50 years, 30 years of your life, you have the right to now talk about Quran, Sunnah, Tafsir, you become an alim, right? Whereas for the other strand of Islam, that type of heritage is not just a person. Uh, it has to be the family of the Prophet ﷺ, and in particular one person, and that is a divinely appointed person. So, Fadak becomes more than just about uh, money and whatnot. And of course, we talked about this inside out, and uh, it is very clear, and we have many, many a hadith. In fact, even Ali ibn Abi Talib has some a hadith to this regard that the, the prophets do not leave behind inheritance, that they, uh, that they give it all to the uh, poor. And so when Abu Bakr al-Siddiq deprived the Al al-Bayt of the inheritance, he also deprived his own daughter, Aisha, of the inheritance. Because if Fatima is not going to inherit, Aisha is not going to inherit. And that's a very simple point to realize that he wasn't doing this out of astaghfirullah, any type of uh, hostility. It was what he thought was the, uh, was the fiqh. Uh, and of course the emotional issue here was their tension between Fatima and Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu anhu majma'in. And we talked about this that there does seem to have been some tension, but it was resolved on the deathbed of Fatima. And we have mentioned explicit narrations that Abu Bakr as-Siddiq visited her on her deathbed. And he begged her to basically get rid of this. And alhamdulillah, everything was fine at the end of her life. And so this is something that we had mentioned and it is very clear. Uh, and of course, uh, Ali radiallahu anhu as well, after this as well, things became uh, better for him. Uh, and so the death of Fatima six months after the, uh, six months after the Prophet sallallahu also opened up the door for Ali radiallahu anhu as well to reconcile more with Abu Bakr as-Siddiq. Because there was some tensions when she was alive. When, with, when, when this conversation took place and she passed away, then it opened the door for Ali as well too. Uh, and that's when he gave the bay'ah. That's when he gave the bay'ah. That's when the, uh, the, 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 the tension was resolved. Uh, Abu Bakr as-Siddiq, now we went into a lot of detail about the wars of Riddah about the wars of Ridda, and I went into all of the uh, Musaylam al-Kathab and Sajjah and all of the ridiculous things between the two of them and other uh, wars. And this is really what Abu Bakr al-Siddiq is primarily known for, and we'll, go, we'll just skip over all of that, no need to get over all of that again. But uh, Abu Bakr al-Siddiq is known for uh, two primary things. Number one is the wars of Ridda. And the wars of Ridda, what did they accomplish? They accomplished consolidating the Muslim Ummah. They accomplished the lack of fragmentation. That Allah saved Islam through Abu Bakr as-Siddiq when the Ummah was about to fracture up. So it's like he collected all of the pieces of the jigsaw puzzle back and he put them together. This is the, the greatest and the first thing that he did. And then the second thing that he did in his Khilafah that is of extremely great importance is Jam' al-Qur'an. Jam' al-Qur'an. He was the one who gathered the Qur'an and it was a blessing from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that Abu Bakr as-Siddiq felt that this was necessary to do because, because of his wise precautions to this day, alhamdulillah, the ummah has been saved from the fitna of every other ummah. Without exception, every nation, every religion has multiple variations of its holy book. Without exception. The Catholics, the Protestants, which version, which how many books are there. The same goes for every religion. Alhamdulillah, we are the only ummah. It doesn't matter what sect you are. It doesn't matter what belief system you have. Even the more bizarre sects of Islam, they still follow the same Quran. 
and they have no variations whatsoever in it. And we will attribute this to the protection of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and then the efforts of Abu Bakr as-Siddiq. And I went over in a lot of detail the version of Abu Bakr, I should say the version, I should say the compilation of Abu Bakr and then the compilation of Uthman ibn Affan, which was based on Abu Bakr as-Siddiq. Literally, Abu Bakr's mushaf was brought again. And they copied it and they sent it out across the lands. So, quite literally, the Qur'an was compiled within a year and a half of the death of the Prophet ﷺ when every single major Sahabi was still alive, including Abu Bakr. When every Hafid that is known was still alive, Ubayy ibn Ka'b and Abdul Rahman ibn Awf and uh, ibn Mas'ud, they're all alive and they're all healthy and they're all reciting the Qur'an. And it is unparalleled in the history of any other religion that its holy book was compiled literally in the lifetime of the people who were alive when it came down. And this is again uh, of the greatest manaqib or the blessings of Abu Bakr as-Siddiq. Okay? Uh, now we move on to the prelude of next week. I'm not going to go into uh, the, the, the final aspect. I'm just going to prelude it. <clears throat> and that is... Uh, the issues of the political and military conquests. We're not going to talk about those ones today. We'll just introduce it. We're going to get into it next week, inshaAllah ta'ala. So Abu Bakr as-Siddiq was only a uh, Khalifa for barely two years and something. Okay, he did not have much time. And of those two years and a few months, in fact, more than half of it was spent in the wars of Ridda. More than half of Abu Bakr as-Siddiq's Khilafa was spent in the wars of the Ridda. So there was very little time to think about broadening Islam beyond that scope. However, in the last year of his life, that was when, when the wars of Ridda were finished and Khalid ibn Walid has basically dealt with all of the Murtadun. Now Abu Bakr as-Siddiq decided to ex expand the Muslim Ummah. And he concentrated on two areas. And the victories began in his lifetime, and they reached the pinnacle in the lifetime of Umar ibn al-Khattab, and in the lifetime of Uthman, it just continued down. So the domino effect had begun. Abu Bakr as-Siddiq was the one who began the domino. We saw the big boost in the time of Umar ibn al-Khattab. The real big massive victories, Umar ibn al-Khattab, Uthman ibn Affan is riding the wave. It just continues the first six years, then it stops. And Ali radiallahu anh stops. Why does it stop? Because of the internal fitna. Okay. So for uh, 12 years, expansion pretty much stopped. 10 to 12 years. Then in the time of the Umayyads, it began to expand in only uh, pockets here and there. But those pockets slowly continued to trickle until they eventually reached from Andalusia, from Spain, all the way to China. This happened in the time of the early Umayyads. And then it simply ceased. Khalas. It fizzled out. And the Ummah pretty much remained as it is from the time of the Umayyads up until now other than small expansions and pockets here and there. Uh, the most recent one being uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina and the Ottoman Empire in the 1830s. This is barely uh, less than 200 years ago when the Ottomans basically uh, entered in and conquered a small part of Europe and because of this Bos Bosnia uh, and Herzegovina as we know are now majority Muslim lands. Otherwise, and of course we lost a few lands in the Lucia. What else did we lose? What else did we lose? That was, that was long, that, we never really controlled it per se. Sicily, Cyprus, these are small, small areas that we lost. Sicily, the island, 250 years. To this day, if you go to Sicily, I have not been, but I always want to go. If you go to Sicily, they say there are still the fortresses built by the Muslims, still over there. And their coins, uh, the, they have coins from that time frame that clearly are in Arabic. And much of their civilization and culture owes itself to the influence of the Arabs, even their language, their version of Italian that they speak, there's much more uh, Arabic heritage in it because for 250 years they were uh, uh, controlled by uh, the Muslims. So the point being, by and large, the big expansions occurred in the time of Umar bin Khattab and then the early Umayyads. The Abbasids hardly did anything in terms of expansion. They did a lot internally, but expansion, hardly anything. And also the other, the Mamluks and whatnot, by and large, there was internal stuff. In any case, back to our uh, topic, Abu Bakr al-Siddiq concentrated on two regions. And those are Iraq and Sham. 
Iraq and Sham. These are the two regions that he uh, concentrated on. Now, today, what I'm going to talk about, I'm not going to talk about the battles right now, because that will be, inshallah, next. Uh, and, and also, by the way, I will not go over each and every battle, because this is not the seerah. We just want to overall talk about what happened, the, the one or two famous battles and incidents, and move on. Um, and, and frankly, it does get very boring very fast. If I start talking about every battle and the numbers here and there, it's not something that the average Muslim is interested in. Uh, but I want to talk about a very, very controversial topic today. And that deals with, who can guess, when we're talking about these conquests, what is the topic? Where at Karbala already did, he was here. It's a two hour lecture, you can find it online. Karbala takes place in the time of way after this, not Abu Bakr as Siddiq. The reasons for these wars. The reasons for these wars. Because there's a huge controversy amongst modern Muslims about the expansion of the Khilafah. And a lot of times what we have been taught or have heard people say, is that these expansions were defensive in nature. That these expansions were defensive. That the Sharia does not allow an offensive war. This is the claim that is given. And this is a claim that is simply false and incorrect. And we do ourselves a disservice by pretending otherwise. By now, all of you are familiar with the fact that I don't beat around the bush and I'm not an apologetic. I call the spade a spade and I believe honesty is the best policy. The claim that there's no such thing as offensive jihad and that the Muslims of early Islam never engaged in conquests is a claim that is simply not backed up by any shred of evidence. In fact, the opposite is true. And that is an undeniable fact, which is why nobody pre-modernity ever said this. This is a very modern notion that is now being back projected onto early Islam. Now, the other side of the coin, which is the people who don't like us, they say, you guys spread Islam by the sword. And that's the other extreme. So, in the next, what, 20 minutes, inshallah, we'll kind of give you the middle. What is the truth of the matter? Was Islam spread by the sword? Or is it all defensive and lovey-dovey and, and, and whatnot? What is the real, you know, every, we're just, we had to fight. That's why we went and fought. What is the reality? Well, the fact of the matter is that in the lifetime of the Prophet Wasallam, we can say without being apologetic at all, that pretty much most of the battles were battles that were defensive in nature. That's very clear. You don't, I mean, you don't have to be an apologetic at all. Look at the situation. Who was persecuting whom? Who kicked whom out of their lands? Who was the one? So it's very clear that Badr and Uhud and Ahzab were very necessary. And even the conquest of Makkah, like it had to be done if you had to survive. You can't just let them keep on attacking you. So in the seerah of the process, we can say that very clearly most of the battles were necessary and were defensive to gain the rights of the Muslims back. However, it is also true to say that not all such battles can easily be put into this category. Some battles, especially some saraya, and remember saraya was the ex expeditions, the Prophet did not participate in, he sent others out. Many of the saraya, especially in 9th and 10th is uh, Islam, there was no dire need, there's no threat at all. Going to the fringes of Oman, for example, Right? Going to the other side of Bahrain, for example. It's not as if there was an immediate threat in some of those saraya. And especially we talked about the Battle of Tabuk. The Battle of Tabuk remains a big question mark amongst Sira specialists. Why? Why was one of the largest armies ever sent up north? For what? And in reality, it seems one of the strongest reasons is to show the powers up north that Muslims meant business and that they are going to attack, which is why Abu Bakr as-Siddiq took the initiative to attack. 
followed the same route when he went to attack when he went to attack Sham. Same route of Tabuk. And he went from Tabuk onwards. So the Prophet was basically setting the precedent for them. Now, whatever is the case about the time of the Prophet there is simply no denying that the Khulafa al-Rashidun and the Umayyads engaged in offensive conquests of other lands. The Sassanid Empire did not pose any immediate threat. They were not attacking the Muslims at all. In fact, as, we're, as we will study, when the Muslims attacked the Sassanid Empire, Rustum said, what are you guys doing here? Why are you attacking us? I mean, we're not bothering you. What are you doing over here? Remember that was the famous, we'll get to that conversation today and next time as well. And the Romans as well couldn't care less about the Arabs. Remember we said this from the very beginning. Both the Romans and the Persians, or I should say the uh, Byzantine Empire and the Sassanid Empire, that's the more precise term, they were minding their own business fighting each other. And they were not fighting the Arabs at the time because they didn't see any strategic advantage in controlling the Arabs. The Arabs were not a civilization that offered anything to them and they didn't care about oil back then, right? Unlike now. So there was no reason for them to invade. If they had wanted to invade, there could have been no stopping them before the coming of Islam. But there was no reason for them. Now that Islam has conquered and is solidified, there was still no immediate reason for them to invade. There's no threat at all. And yet Abu Bakr as-Siddiq sent armies of tens of thousands of people. And Umar al-Khattab followed suit. And the same goes uh, when Umar al-Khattab sent Amr ibn al-As into Egypt. Egypt was not sending any army into Arabia. And Amr ibn al-As with 4,000 people said, Give me 4,000 people, I will give you Alexandria, which was the capital of that region. I'll give, you, I'll give you Alexandria. Why? What was Alexandria doing to the Muslims? Nothing. So the claim that, oh, all of this is a defensive uh, battle, frankly, it, it, it's not proven by anything. And it goes against common sense. Why would you send tens of thousands of people when there's no threat at all? And the fact of the matter, therefore, there is simply no denying this. And the same goes, by the way, even for our lands of, of, of India, of, of Sindh, uh, Makran. Why would the... Okay, it's true that a pirate... Uh, or a small mini lord basically irritated some of the Muslim you know, uh, uh, traders, there's no doubt. But you don't send an army to attack because of a trade dispute. Think about it. You don't send an entire naval expedition to conquer land, which is what happened in Sindh. They conquered land and they established, uh, the Umayyads established an extension of the Umayyad dynasty over there. And that was the beginning of uh, Multan. Multan was the earliest uh, uh, Islamic um, land. Uh, Makran and Multan, these areas, were the earliest Islamic lands. From the time of the Sahaba, some of the Sahaba uh, were alive at this time, when Multan was, was conquered. What, what for? You're going to establish a mini dynasty over there? For what? So clearly, uh, there's not just a defensive jihad going on here. There's no denying that the early Muslims wanted political conquest. Now, is that problematic? Should we try to explain it away? All we need to do is contextualize. All we need to do is contextualize. Contextualize. Firstly, everyone did it, without exception. Every superpower at the time was attacking every other power. That's how those powers survived. It was the law of the time. In fact, it was the law up until medieval Europe, where look at Roman, uh, look at uh, France and, and, and England, for example. I mean, if you ever study their history, all you do is memorize one battle after another, after another, after another. Keep on, they're fighting each other uh, up until modern times, now they're fighting over culture and cuisine and language and whatnot. Still, physical conflict, military conflict was a part of life. And there were regions of the world that switched hands literally dozens of times between competing powers. Damascus is one example. One era it's under the Persians, then it's under the Romans, then it's under the Persians, under the Romans. And the border between the Sassanid Empire and the Byzantine Empire was never established. They're always fighting one another. And Damascus is kind of in the middle. So you had times when the Persians controlled Damascus. Then you had times, most of the time, Romans controlled Damascus. And the same goes for so many other uh, small cities as well. So this was a time frame where everybody is attacking everybody. It's a fact of life. Why should the Muslims be any different? As well, 
There is no denying that of the goals of early Islam was indeed to spread the political power of Islam. In fact, is not that the goal of every civilization? Why were the Romans fighting everybody else? Why did Alexander, why did Alexander in ancient times go and conquer everybody else? That's how civilizations flourished. There's nothing strange about early Islam doing the same. And in our times, by the way, Perhaps it is true that the major superpowers technically don't want to, or I shouldn't put it that way, they technically give the impression they're not invading other lands and countries without provocation. But, okay, suppose, ignore all of the military conflict. Doesn't every nation in our time strive its best to get the most political clout and economic clout and military might than other nations? This is what nations do. This is exactly what every civilization does. And in our times, they might choose other tactics, many of which are unethical. The IMF, for example, right? The superpowers of our times, they use the International Monetary Fund, for example, or they'll use the United Nations. But in essence, in essence, each country and civilization strives to get the most power for itself, including the one we're living, especially the one we're living in. This is a fact of life that is a historically undeniable. So why should we sugarcoat for our own tradition as well? Yes, early Islam wanted political dominion, and guess what? They got it. They got it. They, they put their eyes on the prize, and they indeed uh, got it. A third uh, reason we will mention here, and this gets a little controversial, is the issue of conversion. Conversion. Did these early Muslims want to convert the people that they're conquering? Give me an honest response. What do you guys think? So they would not want them to convert. Where are you from, Akhi, ethnically? You are from Misr. What were, what were your ancestors? Before, when Islam came, what were they? Cops. So when the Sahaba entered your land, you think they wanted your ancestors to remain cops? Ah, that wasn't my question. That was not my question. My question was, and this one being, I'm being a little bit pressing here because I need the correct answer. Because we're living at a time and place where giving these politically correct answers is politically incorrect. We have to be frank and firm, and when we do so, we will actually be able to win arguments. Did the Sahaba want their conquered peoples to convert? That's not answering the question. Did they want them to convert? Sure, exactly. Jazakallah khair. That's the point. Did they want them to convert? Sure they did. Was that a motivational factor? Ya'ak jazakallahu khairan. That's what I wanted to hear. This is the reality. If it wasn't a motivational factor, my ancestors worshipped cows. They would still, I would still be worshipping cows if they hadn't come. Your ancestors worshipped a cross. And if it weren't for the blessings of Allah through these conquests, probably you would also be worshipping a cross now. Do we understand this? We should stop sugarcoating. That's the reality. They came not just for political power, yes for political power, yes for economic power, but as well they did want the people to convert. Now we get to the second question, which is what you're trying to get at, right? But I want to get the difficult out of the way. Did they force people to convert? That question we can alhamdulillah say without being apologetic because that is a fact. No, they didn't force people to convert. They did not force people to convert and in fact they knew that it was not a part of their religion to force people to convert. It is because they did not force people to convert that to this day the lands that were under the Mughal Empire, majority of them are still Hindu. The lands that were under the Muslims of Egypt when the Muslims entered Egypt, literally 99.999999% were Coptic Christians, right? This is a documented historical fact that has been, lots of research has been done on this by looking at the registrars of names, Christian names versus Muslim names. And plenty of research has been done and we notice and we find that in Egypt, for example, over the course of the last, especially the first 12 centuries of concrete, not the last 200 years, not since the British came, when the British came, colonialization that changed everything. But up until the era of Napoleon, when did Napoleon enter Egypt? 1798. 
1798, he entered Egypt. Up until the era of, of colonization, which is relatively recent, 1798 is after America was founded. Okay, that's when colon colonialism begins with Napoleon invading Egypt. This is the beginning of European colonization of Islamic lands. Up until that point in time, the conversion rate from Coptic Christianity to Islam never spiked at one time from zero to 100. Rather, we see from the conquest of Islam up until Napoleon, slowly the numbers just continue to increase until they kind of peter out at 90%, which is what Egypt is now. 90% Muslim, 10% Coptic. To this day, Egypt, which was 100% Coptic, one out of every 10 Egyptians is still a Coptic. Why? Because there really was freedom of religion. There really was, not, not the types of freedom that exist in the modern West, there's no doubt about it, let's not again sugarcoat, not the types of freedoms, but there was the freedom to be a Coptic Christian, to worship, to practice the laws of Coptic Christianity, to do the rituals, to pass it down to your children. You could remain Coptic. And that therefore, one out of every ten Egyptians to this day remain Coptic. Okay? So, never in the history of Islam, and this is not being apologetic, this is the truth, was a sword waved in the face of somebody and he was told, convert or die. That didn't happen. But did the Sahaba and the early Muslims desire their subjects to convert? Wallahi, they did. Of course they did. Wouldn't you desire other people to convert? Now you're ruling them, wouldn't you give them incentives to convert? That's what the Sharia does, by the way. That's what the Sharia does. The Sharia gives you incentives. If you don't convert, you have to pay extra tax. You have certain restrictions. You have this, you have that. But you're allowed to live your life according to your faith. So, one of the goals of invading these lands was indeed to convert the people, but not by force. How so then? Multiple ways. First and foremost, simply by interacting with the Muslims. Now, if Islam is the truth, and we all believe it is the truth, Yet, the bulk of humanity, suppose there's no internet, pre-social pre media, let's go back a hundred years. So, the tribes of Africa, the, the jungles of Tibet and whatnot, how are these people going to be exposed to Islam? By interaction. And what better way of interaction than the civilization of Islam trickles out and spreads, which is what early Islam did. And what better way to see the reality of Islam than to see the fruits of an Islamic civilization? You live under an Islamic civilization. You see what it can offer you. You see its dominance. You see its heritage. You compare it with the people before and the people you think might come afterwards. And then guess what? You're like, man, this makes a lot of sense. I like it. I want to convert. And that is why my ancestors and your ancestors converted. Nobody put a sword on their throats. They, at some point in, in my history and your history, somebody, well, I know it's my great-great-grandfather, I, I know exactly, four I don't know about you if you know or not, but I know exactly, exactly how many generations ago, somebody was a Hindu and they converted to Islam. They decided of their own free will. Nobody forced them to do that. Interacting with the Muslims of India, living under the Nawabs of Lucknow, they realized, oh, you know what, this is a good religion, I want to embrace it. Your ancestors as well. How would that have happened unless the Sahaba and Tabi'un and the Umayyads invaded these lands and allowed Islam to flourish so that people could see this is Islam. Correct? So let's not sugarcoat it. One of the reasons of invasion was indeed conversion by seeing the lived experiences and yes, and I've said this before as well, by even offering incentives. Because when you're so sure that something is good, you know, people do this all the time to their products, when they're selling their products, right? They'll give you an incentive to buy it. Because they know that their product is so good, once you're used to it and you like it, khalas, you're going to keep on getting more. So, if we as Muslims believe this, why are we surprised then that the Sharia is so confident that people will accept it, that it gives them perks and incentives, which it does. It does give perks and incentives for you to accept the faith. Because it knows, once you do so for whatever reason, suppose you do it out of greed, you want more money, so your taxes are lifted, 
because they will be lifted, right? If you, again, I don't sugarcoat. If you were a non-Muslim, you had to pay jizya in the Khilafah, in the Abbasid times and whatnot. Somebody was greedy and said, you know what? I don't want to pay this jizya. I'm just going to convert because I want more money in my pocket. What's going to happen? In time, if not him, then who? Children. The children, for sure. Which is exactly what happened. Correct? Which is exactly what happened. That in time, and we see this all the time, I've given this example many times, uh, converts, we see them to this day. Many times, number one reason people convert now is not because of money. We don't got any money to offer you that. But it's what? It's love. It's love. It's like they fall in love and they want to get married. Okay? So they convert because of love. Then what happens? Usually they become more Islamic than the real spouse. And then the spouse comes running. I don't know what happened to my wife, man. She's fanatic. Would not do something. Like, Alhamdulillah. Okay, this is what happens. Okay? That's the reality of... So what has just happened over here? Truth has won over. Truth has won over. We're so confident in the truth of Islam. Yalla, go ahead. You want to be greedy for the money? Okay, you use your incentive. But we know eventually it's going gonna, it's gonna to come inside of you. So, yes, it is true that one of the reasons for invasion was also conversion, but not direct, indirect. And by the way, this is also a fact that needs to be mentioned. There were khulafa and there were dynasties that discouraged, discouraged conversion. And some of the Umayyad Khulafa made conversion very difficult, which is one of the reasons why the Abbasid revolution took place. Because there was discrimination. They didn't want you to convert. Why would they not want you to convert? Taxes. Taxes. They wanted more taxes. And so they put hurdles in conversion. And that's one of the reasons why the Mawali, the Mawali are the non-Arab converts. They joined the Banu Hashemite revolt, the Ali, the Alawi revolt against the uh, Umayyads. Okay, so this is another reason. And then one final point that we'll mention here: we have the explicit testimony of one of the Sahaba, Rib'i ibn Amir, when he stood in front of Rustum, the general governor uh, of the Sassanid Empire. The primary general, he wasn't the Khalifa, he wasn't the ruler, he was the general, the primary general, the military genius of the uh, Sassanid Empire. And we'll talk about him next week a little bit as well. When Rib'i ibn Amr was standing in front of Rustum, in the palace of Rustum, in that luxurious palace, the ruins of which still stand to this day at Tessaphon, to this day they stand those massive beautiful pillars and whatnot, one of the architectural wonders of the ancient world. You know, the, the, per, the Persians would build massive structures. And Rib'i is asked by Rustum, why are you invading us? What are you doing here? Go back to your lands. What are you doing here? And Rib'i said what? That famous line, you should all memorize that famous line, that Rib'i said that Allah has sent us لِنُخْرِجَ ibad مِنْ عِبَادَةِ ibad إِلَىٰ عِبَادَةِ رَبِّ الْعِبَادِ Allah has sent us so that we take Mankind, from worshipping others of mankind to worshipping the Lord of mankind. وَمِنْ جَوْرِ الْأَدْيَانِ إِلَىٰ عَدْلِ الْإِسْلَامِ And from the tyranny of all false religions to the justice and truth of Islam. وَمِنْ ضِيقِ الدُّنْيَا إِلَىٰ سَعَةِ الْآخِرَةِ And from the confines of this world to the beauty of the next. Now, Rib'i's motivation is what? Spreading Islam. Da'wah. How can you deny this? It's in his testimony, standing in front of the Persian general. Why have you come here? We have come لِنُخْرِجَ الْعِبَادِ مِنْ عِبَادَةِ الْعِبَادِ إِلَىٰ عِبَادَةِ رَبِّ الْعِبَادِ Memorize this, simple. The Sahaba themselves are telling you their motivation. It wasn't money. Yes, the Umayyads and some of them, the prime motivation was economic, but there's nothing wrong with that. Civilizations need that as well. The Sahaba, their primary motivation was what? They understood this is the way to spread Islam. Not by waving the sword in front of the necks of people, but by showing Islam as a civilization. By ruling as a dominant military and political force, the people see this is Islam and then they choose to embrace it. Which is exactly what happened in the history of humanity, in the history of the Ummah. All of us, look, we have people from Africa, from uh, uh, India, Pakistan, from Egypt, from Timbuktu, from uh, wh where, how? All of our ancestors had other faiths. 
All of us. Where, 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 where did this Islam come from? It's because Islam spread as a dominant political force. This is offensive. This is not defensive. This is offensive. And we thank Allah for that offensive. We thank Allah for that, and that is why Islam spread the way that it is. Now, the final point here, and by the way, so this whole point of spreading what you think is the truth, why are we so embarrassed about this, when this is exactly what our own country and every other military superpower in our world does today? They go fighting for what? Oil? Okay, well, for oil, yes, but what do they say they fight for? Democracy. Sah wa la Right? Human rights, for the right of women to not wear the burqa, we're going to go invade Afghanistan. I mean, literally, that's what they said, right? To give the, make women, liberate women, so that they don't have to wear the burqa. Now, they're so confident in their values, they're willing to go to war, and they proudly boast. We're invading to spread democracy, we're going to bomb democracy into them. We're going to show them what human rights is by our 20 ton bombs. Okay, khalas. By throwing tons of bombs, you're going to show them human rights. But they're confident enough to say this. And their people swallow it up. That yes, this is why we're going. So why should we be embarrassed that our classical heritage, we're not talking about modern times. We're talking about the Khulafa Rashid and the Umayyads. Our classical heritage, they as well felt this much confidence, if not more so. We have the truth and we're spreading the truth. Sah? This is what happens. Right Now, here is where the big uh, question comes. And that is, does this mean that we have to resurrect that understanding? That's why a lot of Muslims now, especially in light of ISIS and Al-Qaeda and all of these weird groups, that's why a lot of Muslims now, they're like worried to even say what I just said. Because it's very easy to take snippets of what I just said, which is what Fox News will do anyway, and Put it online and say, oh, radical preacher and whatnot. That's understandable. It's understandable. Okay? Which is why we also have to make a very simple and clear disclaimer. We're talking about the past. And we're talking about the Khulafa al-Rashidun and the Umayyads. And the spread of Islam in the 7th century. Do we have to resurrect those ideas in our times? And follow some of those same notions? Well, ISIS thinks so. But what percentage does ISIS represent of the Ummah? Where are the rest of the ulama of our Ummah? As we all know, the bulk of the ulama, the vast majority, in fact, the ulama period, because ISIS does not have ulama, Qaeda does not have ulama, pretty much all ulama of all stripes, from the Ubandis to Ikhwan to Azhadis to Salafis, the bulk of the Ummah basically, they all understand that we're living in different times. That there's now a United Nations, there's peace treaties, there's borders. There were no borders in medieval Christianity. Forget medieval Islam. There were no borders in Europe up until, you know, the Treaty of Westphalian was a 16, you should know this, a 16, where's your daughter, ask her, the history expert, 16 something, Treaty of Westphalia. The Treaty of Westphalia is when nation states were born. This is before this time, there were no borders, no boundaries. Look again at France and, 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 and England, always attacking one another. World War I is what codified some boundaries. And then even then, and we're constantly redrawing the map. Before 16, 1700s, there were no border states. So things have changed. And pretty much everybody, that's anybody, says, nowadays, the concept of offensive jihad does not make sense. Nowadays, we don't have to now resurrect this thing. There's no need to do this. And this is the fatwa of Sheikh Qardawi, his latest, latest book, and in all likelihood, his last one is already, what, 85 years old. May Allah give him a long life. But Sheikh Qardawi's latest book, mag magnificent, huge volumes, the fiqh of jihad is called, fiqh al-jihad. And he wrote it in a post-9-11 world. He wrote it because of all of these groups, al-Qaeda and whatnot. This is before ISIS came along. And it was a refutation of this. So his book, thick volumes, fiqh al-jihad. In it are sections about the United Nations, are sections about borders. And he basically says what all the ulama are saying, that in our times, with these treaties, with these international boundaries, it is actually in everybody's interest that peace reigns in the world. We shouldn't be attacking and fighting and, and doing offensive jihad. And he goes, these days, the jihad now is not of the sword, it is of the 
pen and the intellect and the mind and social media and whatnot. So this is mainstream Sunni fiqh. Therefore, what we have said about Islamic history, there's no need to sugarcoat it. It is as it is. And we thank Allah that that's what happened. But we do not have to resurrect it in our times. We do not have to bring back on offensive jihad. An offensive jihad has many conditions. The first of them is a legitimate khilafah. That's the first condition. Then you have many others. And we all know that really there is no legitimate uh, khilafah in our times. So the bottom line, there is no need for us to be apologetic, to try to sugarcoat the past. Yes, indeed, Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu anhu intended to wage war against the Sassanids and the Byzantine Empire. Because he wanted to spread Islamic laws, civilizations, values, and yes, the religion. And he succeeded in doing that. And that was the beginning of much bigger success to happen. And inshallah, with that we will stop for today. And next Wednesday, inshallah, I will uh, begin summarizing the main battles that occurred. Uh, and perhaps even finish. If not, it will be the Wednesday after that.